I'm just going to begin, as always, with a time of prayer. Father, now as we open up your word, as we seek the truths of what you say, we ask that you would speak powerfully, noticeably. Father, make yourself present, we ask. Amen. Well, we're continuing through our series of, in the Psalms, and uh, can you believe we're in Psalm 40? We're coming to the end now of uh, Book 1 in the Psalms, and uh, we began our series when we first went into lockdown. So we've been going through this series since March 2020, which is a long time ago now, isn't it? But as we've gone through the Psalms, what we have seen continually is God's goodness, the crying out of his people, and the answer that he gives. Well, we're in the, the penultimate psalm now. We're coming up to the end of book one, but what I've done is I, I, I want to cover the whole of, of Psalm 40, but I couldn't do it in one sermon. So for this sermon, I'm just going to be focusing on the beginning of Psalm 40, and then uh, maybe next week or the week after, I'll come back and I'll finish off Psalm 40. There's so much truth in this. And what I want us to see as we come before this is I want to see that we need to be more reliant on Jesus Christ. I think a lot of us are too reliant on ourselves and that is to the detriment. I think many of us think, oh, I'll be fine. I'll do it. I'll get through it. When actually what we should be thinking is, with him, I'll be fine. In Christ, I'll get through it. There's a huge difference between being self-confident of yourself and being self-confident because Christ is with me. And that's what I want us to get across today is how we need a, to move from a self-centric position to a Christ-centric position. But I also want to address the point that some of you might not be self-reliant. Some of you might be dependent on God in a way that is actually unbiblical. What does that mean? Sam, what are you talking about? How can you be dependent on God in an unbiblical way? Well, I do think there is a danger of going the opposite way. Instead of relying on yourself to say, it's all in God's hands, I haven't got to do anything now, have I? God will take care of it. God will do it. I don't have to do anything because God will work out his plans and his purposes without me. And it is true, God does not need you. But if you do not want to be used by God, if you do not want to live in service to Jesus Christ, I think there is a spiritual error within your thinking. Because God is God doesn't negate any responsibility that we have. We are to be wholly reliant on him because we can do nothing without him. But with him, we should be able to serve him. With his strength, in his power, there is work to be done. And that's what we're going to look at in Psalm 40. Just the first three verses. I want to begin with the one thing that David did, and then I want to look at the two things that God does. And I think that's a really helpful balance, and it reminds us that it's mostly God. Everything we do, it is by his power and his strength. For the Lord can achieve what we cannot. My first point is uh, from the perspective of, of David and Maybe it's from the perspective of what we should be. My first point is, I waited. Verse 1 says this. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined, his, he inclined to me and heard my cry. Well, whether you like it or not, waiting is a big part of our life, isn't it? And, and just looking by, by your eyes, many of you do not like waiting. 
It is, a, it is an aspect, an element of our lives that we cannot stand. Our lives are so dominated by waiting that there's entire rooms that are just for waiting. You just go in and sit and there's no purpose behind them other than to wait. I hate waiting. And I think our culture is a culture of immediacy. Our culture is a culture of now, now, now. If you had a question years ago, you'd have to wait until your intelligent friend arrived and you'd ask them. Maybe you'd have to discuss it with a group of people to try and work out the answer. Maybe you had to go into your library and, and scan the long shelves and look for a big dusty book that you'd take out of the shelf and blow the dust off and then you'd have to look at the chapter. Most of us and all of us with smartphones in seconds can find the answers to questions. Our society is changing and it is a society that wants everything and it wants it now. It is our society that wants and wants. And here David says, I waited. Well, we do that, don't we? We wait and we twiddle our thumbs. We wait and we grumble. We wait and we complain. We wait and we roll our eyes and we tut. But David says, I waited patiently. That's a challenge for all of us, I think, isn't it? To wait patiently. So many of us, the slightest frustration or inconvenience sends us on a spiral of moaning and complaining. At least it does for me anyway. The smallest thing goes wrong and it can set us off. But David waits. David is patient. Remember back to being a child. Having to wait a whole year for Christmas seemed impossible, didn't it? And I certainly wasn't very patient when I was a child, and the nearer the day got, the more impatient I'd get. Waiting is hard. Waiting is difficult. But the question I want to ask is, what are you waiting for? It doesn't just matter about waiting. The question is, who are you waiting for? I'm sure many of us have had the experience where we phone up. Maybe it's something to do with our broadband or our house insurance, and we are on the phone, and we get put on hold. We get put on hold, and we're there for absolutely ages. What feels like an eternity passes, and we're still waiting. And then the person finally answers, and it becomes very obvious, doesn't it? They're the wrong person or they're just useless. (laughs) They're not going to help. They're not able to help. All that waiting that we've done has been in vain because we need to contact somebody else. Be careful who you wait for. David was making no chances. David was leaving nothing up to chance, for it says, I waited patiently for the Lord. David knows who he's waiting for. David knows who is worth waiting for. David knows that the Lord will never let him down, will never abandon him, will never forget him. David waited for the Lord in patience. I wonder when was the last time that we waited upon God? When was the last time we waited upon God with patience? David was not waiting begrudgingly or complaining, but in patience. Some theologians tell me that uh, the Hebrew sort of is a bit more literal and uh, that the Hebrew could be translated, in waiting, I waited. It's that idea that he waited and he waited and after that, he did some more waiting. But through all of it, he was patient. How can David be patient? Well, I think David was patient because he was confident in what the Lord can do. David knew who his God was. David knew all of the times where he had desperately needed God's help and God had come to his rescue. God had helped. God had stepped down. One of the greatest issues, I think, of the Christian church is that instead of waiting for God, we act in self. 
Instead of waiting for God, we act in self. I wonder, are we too eager to do something? Would we rather just do it badly rather than pray over it, think about it? And I wonder if God is ever slow in our mind, if God is ever slow to answer our prayers, I wonder how quickly we start to grumble and moan. Let David be an example. Wait patiently. But there's one thing I want us to fully understand. David was not waiting passively. David was waiting actively. Well, what do I mean by that? Waiting is surely you sit there, there's nothing to do. David was waiting actively. You'll see what I mean by the end of verse 1. Verse 1 says that he inclined to me and heard my cry. For God to hear David's cry we must first realize and understand David was crying out to God. David was not just waiting for God to work and for God to move. David was seeking after God. The word cry, there's a sense of urgency, of desperation. David was desperate for God to hear, desperate for God to move, desperate for God to work. I wonder, do we sometimes wait for God to move without begging him to work? We need to be waiting, but waiting in prayer. And the word inclined, we've covered this a lot throughout the Psalms, and uh, I, I'll just mention it briefly. The word here, we've, we've seen it so many times in the Psalms, and it is just a reminder. It has the connotations of God purposefully listening to us. He hasn't just heard, overheard David. He's inclined his ear. He wants to hear the cry of his people. The idea here is that God is bending earthwards. As David is crying out, God is bending towards him. The statement and the word inclined his ear, it removes any sense of distance or misunderstanding between us and God. God doesn't misunderstand us. God isn't too far away to not hear us. David waited patiently in prayer. My second point begins us now looking at what God does. So we've looked at what David does, but let's see what God does. Our second point comes from verse 2. And the second point is, he drew. He drew. But as we approach God's response, I just want to point out the obvious. We want to ignore verse 1 as quickly as possible, don't we? We hate waiting. We, we, ironically, we don't want to wait. We just want to get straight to verse 2. But as verse 2 begins, I just want to remind you, we don't know how long David was waiting for. And I think that's really important. We don't know how much time has passed between verse 1 and verse 2. In your deep prayers, I don't know how much time has passed. Wait patiently for the Lord. But here we are on God's answer. Verse 2 begins, He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog. He drew me up. This idea of being drawn to safety, it reminds me, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it reminds me of a, uh, like a helicopter, a search and rescue mission, where there's somebody who's stuck maybe in the ocean or maybe they've had a, a fall off a cliff, and the helicopter will come overhead and lower down the winch, lower down the bed, Lower down the rescue, the help and support. All around the person is danger and disaster and destruction. And then from the sky, if I can put it this way, from the heavens, salvation comes. This is what it reminds me of. He drew me up from the pit. Danger everywhere. And these people step down into the midst of the danger to draw us up, to help us. 
So it is with Christ himself, isn't it? We were in a mess, and he came down to draw us to him. I'm sure many of us struggle to get past this. I'm sure it's not just me. Jesus stepped down. I can, I can believe that. Jesus stepped down to save those really good, holy people. I, I know why Jesus saved that lot over there or those people there. I know why Jesus saved this great preacher or this great man of God. I think the thing we sometimes struggle with is David says he drew me up. And David was an adulterous murderer. And God drew him up. And in your lives, you might not be anything special. You might have done awful things. And the reality is, if you know Jesus Christ, he drew you up. Not just those super holy people. Not just those people who are lovely and kind and generous. But you, in your mess, in your state, in your sin, he remembered you. I don't think we'll ever fully get past or understand why he chose to step down into the mess I'd made and save me. Ordinary me? The questions that we, we might arise from this is, that Jesus left heaven for me? Jesus took on flesh for me? Jesus lived the perfect life for me? Jesus prayed for me? Jesus was beaten for me? Jesus was betrayed for me. Jesus died for me. Jesus drew me near to himself. Jesus clothed me in his righteousness. I say this, the answer to all of these questions, if you put your trust in him, is yes. Yes, yes, a thousand times yes. For you, he stepped up. For you, he draw you out. I, I love the description here, from the pit of destruction. What has Christ drawn us from? Jesus Christ, by the scruff of our necks, has grabbed us and yanked us from the everlasting, the everlasting, never-quenching fires of hell. Christ has drawn us out of it. And we are free for me. Little old insignificant me. And for everyone who is trusting in Jesus, he has drawn us near. He drew us up. He stepped down into our pain and sorrow and salvation is offered. If you know Christ, then you should know you are forgiven. You are set free. He lives in you. And more than that, he is preparing a place for you. Even in the midst of great pain, why was David able to wait? Because look at who God is. Look at what God has done, and you will find he is worth waiting for. In everything, he is worth it. Do you know what it is that Jesus has stepped down when there was no hope and has offered you just that? Hope. Forgiveness. David uses the imagery of a miry bog, and it reminds me a little bit of when you step in a bog and you think, I'll make it, I'll be fine. And step by step by step, it begins to get deeper, and you begin to sink. I think David felt overwhelmed, unable to escape, unable to get away. David felt trapped and stuck. David was trapped. But God doesn't just draw us up. He does something even better. The end of verse 2, And he set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. David doesn't just, uh, God doesn't just draw David up out of the pit and leave him. He draws him out of the pit and puts him somewhere safe. Puts him somewhere secure. This reminds me of, uh, and maybe you're one of them, some people who go on a boat and they are not safe, they are not happy, they are not comfortable until their feet is on ground that doesn't do this. They're not happy until their feet is on ground that doesn't move. 
He set my feet upon a rock. Something firm, something secure, something that's not going to move, something that's not going to be toppled easily. Making my steps secure. Do you know what it is to have security? Not job security, not financial security, but security from death itself. For has Christ put you on the rock? All these grumblings and moanings, we we need to watch out. How can we grumble? How can we complain? How can we moan to a God who has done this for us? In our deepest, greatest problem, he has drawn us out of it. Jesus is the rescuer, the great deliverer, the great saviour, the only one who could my final point, God does not stop there. There's something else that God does. The second thing we see God do, and my third point comes from verse 3. He put a new song in my mouth. A song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Amen. God places a new song in David's mouth. What is this song? What does it mean? Well, the new song, the first thing I want us to point out is it all, it, its origins are from God himself. There's something so beautiful and special. David hasn't just come up with a new nice song. God has implanted it in him. All of that waiting is worth it now, for God is moving and God is working and a new song erupts and bursts forth in David. God inspires praise in David of himself. And my hope and my prayer today is God would inspire in you praise for himself. That's my great hope and my great prayer for today. David has been delivered and now he is full of praise. If you have been delivered by Jesus Christ, you should be full of praise. A new song. A song to the Almighty One. And I wonder what that song was. I wonder maybe if it was one of the Psalms. I wonder if David sang it to lots of people. I wonder if it was well known. I wonder if the rest of Psalm 40 is this new song, this new song that God has put in David. I don't know, but what I know is this. David, after confronting God in prayer, after coming to the reality that God has stepped down and rescued him, David is full to bursting with praise and joy to the Almighty God. And so it should be with us. But what about the non-musicians? I'm a non-musician, you, you've probably guessed that by now. I have never woken up and sung with a good voice. But I've woken up many times and sung with a bad voice. I've never had music or, or words come to me. i never sat down at a piano and instantly been able to play it. Well, any good anyway. I've been able to just randomly hit notes, but it's not very melodious. What, what hope for non-musicians for this new song? Are we excluded, those who are musically unable? Are we excluded from this promise? We are all not called to be musicians. Not all of us are called to be musicians. However, all of us, all of us as Christians, ought to have a song in our hearts. All of us have to have something to praise God for. All of us ought to have some joy to hold on to him for. Every day that passes, there is a new thing to give thanks to God for. Every day that continues, I, I love the hymn, morning by morning, new mercies I see. And what should the result of that hymn be? What should the result of the new mercies be? If there's new mercies, there should be new praise, new thanks. Uh, it's important that we never lose or we never forget to praise God for the big things, for Christ, for the Creator, 
We never forget to praise God for those things, but in your life, the outworking of God's faithfulness, it doesn't change from day to day, but it is realised in different ways day to day. It's wonderful that no matter how old you are, I'll say nothing else about that, no matter how old you are, there is always something new to worship God for. There is always something else to praise him for. I wonder today, what is your new song? What is that thing that you can say today has been rubbish? But even in this rubbish day, God has done this. Even in this day, I have had this. Even in this day, I felt God being near me. What is your new song for today? I think some people spend most of their days trying to come up with a new complaint more than new praise. Let's praise God more than we complain to him. What is this song that is going to capture you? What is this song that is going to fill you? What has God done for you this day? Maybe you'll take a walk out after putting on far too much sunscreen. But it's a lovely day. Maybe you'll take a walk outside. Maybe you'll thank God for the cool of the air. Maybe you'll thank God for the beauty of his creation. Maybe you'll bump in and see somebody and thank God for the opportunity to witness to them. Maybe you'll sit inside and be thankful for the cool. Maybe deep tragedy will strike. But even in that, you will know the Lord. I wonder, what is your new hope? What is your new song? For every day, every morning, God is that good. God is that big for us to be worshipping and praising him all over again. And I'm going to end on this. This new song does not mean that God changes his character or his personality. It just means that every day we are blessed. Every day we are kept. Every day we are held by him. But what's the, what's the point? You know, it's nice to be praising. It's nice to have joy in us. But so what? What's the end result? God's put a song in David. Well, so what? Doesn't bother me. I don't care. The end of verse 3. Look at this. This is wonderful. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God, and many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. This song that God puts in you, this filling and, and fillness, the being full of praise to God, it doesn't just benefit you, although it will, but oh, that we would be so full of praise that people notice. That's what David is saying. He's so full of praise that people see him See his rejoicing. See his happiness. Maybe in the midst of the chaos that David was in, the pain and the suffering and anguish that David was in, people saw something was different. People could see the song within David. Many will see. I wonder how many people you come into contact with over the course of a year. I wonder what Morrison would look like if those people that you came in contact with, maybe over a five-minute conversation that you had, imagine if they saw the song of praise in your life. Imagine if they saw how joyful God's drawing and rescuing and deliverance has made you. Imagine what Morrison would look like if many saw. And that's just one of us. <laughs> Imagine if we all had a song from God himself. Imagine if we were all worshipping and praising him. Imagine if we were all looking above instead of complaining about what's below. Imagine many seeing many. And what is our hope? What is our end goal? What is our result? That God would fill us so that they would put their trust in the Lord. What a hope, what a prayer. I'll begin the way I started. I hate waiting. I absolutely cannot stand it. But if there's one thing that's worth waiting for, it's to know God has delivered us. 
It's to know that God has saved us. It's to know that God has rescued us. It's to have that praising heart, day by day, worshipping the Almighty. And more than that, it is that many people will come to know Jesus Christ through our testimony, through our witness. I don't know about you, but to me that feels like it's worth waiting for, worth the praying, worth the constant asking for God to move and for God to speak, for God to fill us. I wonder, are we waiting for God actively? Are we waiting for God to move with great prayer, with great, uh, with great crying out? I'll just end with this. I'll put it this way. A song, the song of praise to our God. Our song is heard by God, but it's also seen by man. And that is the power of it. I wonder today, what are you going to praise God for? What are you going to give thanks for? I wonder, is your prayer going to be that many will see and fear and they will put their trust in the Lord? Amen.